Who are you, Ian? Welcome to Aquinas College. Good to see you. Picked a glorious day for it. It's absolutely beautiful. Do you want to come through? Thank you. So we're here to talk about Dan, eh? Young Dan Mazzotti, for sure. So what can you tell me about Dan Mazzotti, the man? Well, let me just tell you a little bit about Dan in respect of, of when he first arrived. There was no art facilities, as in art department. There was no um, special room where kids could take their, their art lessons. So what he ended up doing, Dan walked around with a roll of paper and some charcoal from class to class, particularly in the primary school. And he used the blackboard as the place to deliver his lessons. It was great fun. It was hard work for Dan, it's all different these days, but he, he did a top job. It wasn't until I think 19, I think it was about a couple of years later, uh, they gave Dan an old laboratory, a science laboratory, where he taught art, like a lecture theatre sort of set up, so kids would go in there with their coloured pencils and learn about colour and about drawing, and he administered his lessons with great style as only Dan could do in that environment. Yeah. Well, here we are in the Aquinas College Chapel Inn, and, and here's Dan's rendition of the Stations of the Cross. Again, wonderful pieces. He uses materials differently. They look like sort of metallic type works, and they're made of plaster, and also uh, given a polish of, of bronze and uh, the copper uh, polish that he used there to give this effect. So I began at Aquinas College in 1968, and Dan came into the school in 1969. Brother Leo Hassan found that there was, he was a headmaster at the time, he found that there was a great need for young kids to learn about art, to learn about visual literacy. So we employed Dan Mazzotti. He heard about Dan and, and got him to do the Stations of the Cross. He loved his behaviour, loved his personality and knew that he was an extremely talented uh, artist and art teacher. Well, as I, as I said last week, the, the scope of the course not so much a program because you don't, ha don't have a program really, but the scope of the course is um, to encourage you to be creative. Um, and of course, when you start a painting, you have to think about design, very, very important. You design it uh, according to, of course, your like or dislike for forms or colors or whatever. But designing a painting, the importance of it is the fact that every part of the painting will play a part. Every, every little corner of the painting plays a part in a composition. That's very important. Now, as for creativity, it's uh, up to the individual. I'm not going to influence anyone to paint like the way I do. Um, so, whatever type of painting you want to do, um, be it realistic or abstract, it doesn't matter. I will help, as I've been doing, each one of you in your own direction. Leaving your own personality intact is very important. At the end of the term, we do assess the work. We discuss it. Uh, in turn, each of, each of you will be doing that. When I see your work and uh, consider it finished, because to me, uh, to my knowledge, it is finished because it has no uh, voids, no uh, missing uh, areas and so on. And I said, now stop. And sometimes I, I say it categorically, now stop, that's all right. Um, but sometimes there is a, the person that when I turn my back, I <laughs> again, <laughs> keep on working. So when you feel that you don't have anything to do to it, you don't know what to do to it, well, at that time, the painting is finished, and leave it. And then you go back, to, you can go back to it later on and say, oh yes, look, it misses something, and you do it. But the moment you feel you don't know what to do to it, don't doodle, just stop, and do something else. He was always referred to as Mr. Art from virtually the day he got there. He was uh, such a lovely guy, wonderful personality, and how he approached his teaching of art was, which in those days particularly was quite unique. He used uh, sculptures by, or reproductions of sculptures by Michelangelo and very, uh, various other Renaissance artists. Could you describe his style for me? 
Well, it's a little varied. It depends if you're looking at his sculptural work, his mosaics, his drawings, or uh, his paintings there. Most people, I think, would refer to Dan as uh, a painter that is expressionistic in his approach, though he has done classical portraits, uh, and also quite different, again, when you look at his sculptural work, which, uh, as you saw at the front of the school, uh, well, looks like it's made of clay, this particular piece, but is actually made of fiberglass. He made out of clay originally and then sculpted it uh, over the surface with fiberglass and then gave it a colour. How he rounds his work uh, is classically Dan and classically to me personally Italian. How does his work stand up in the community, in the art community? Very, very much so. Dan is known in Western Australia and, and over in the Eastern States. Uh, he has done all sorts of things from landscape to sculpture to ceramic work. Uh, etc. He's got work uh, commissioned by the Russian Orthodox Church, he's got work by the Catholic Church down in Augusta and all around Perth, Rockingham and particularly here at Aquinas College, let alone the Eastern States where he's got, uh, had many, many exhibitions. And when he finally did return to Ravenna, as he may have mentioned to you, uh, he had an exhibition of work there as well, his hometown. Does he have a particular forte in your opinion? Well, that would be very personal to say. I love Dan's sculpture, and he is a master of mosaics. Uh, having been trained as a younger lad in Ravenna, in Italy, uh, he learnt the long, hard slog of the production of mosaic work. Very time-consuming, very difficult, and even the selection of the tiles, the coloured tiles, uh, he is he's brilliant at. You, you keep referring to Ravenna. Is that famous for anything in particular? Uh, it certainly is. I've never been to Italy, and uh, so no doubt I've not been to Ravenna, but it is a place known for the study of mosaics and many other forms of art, but particularly mosaics. Dan's got his own approach and style. He certainly is expressionistic when it comes to the painting side of things. I, I, refer, I can see elements of colour um, which would probably relate to an artist by the name of Arshal Gorky. A little while ago, a portrait of uh, Brother Redmond, who was one of the Christian brothers who taught and worked here at Aquinas and other places. His nickname was Reddy, and he captured him so beautifully. I was here at Aquinas College when he uh, produced that portrait, or he used that portrait to teach students about art. That's another interesting thing about Dan. That's really done these days where an art teacher produces artwork with and in front of the student. It's very time consuming and you don't have your normal programming for that to create. You feel the artwork. Have you tried some of his homemade wine? I certainly have tried some uh, called Dan's Drop. I've drunk much, uh, or let's say at least uh, a quarter of a bottle with Dan over time. And uh, it's not a bad drop at that. Did Dan ever have a philosophy when working with art? Yes, he did. Uh, and from when I was, I think he taught me, I've known Dan for 33 years, and I suppose from that was from when I was in grade five, all the way through to uh, finishing school. And I had the privilege of working with Dan for some five or so years at Aquinas College as uh, his colleague and art teacher, teaching art uh, with him. And the philosophy that he had was that art is to be enjoyed, it's important to learn about the concept of aesthetics, what is beauty to the beholder, and that depends on many, it depends on the situation, who is the beholder, but, uh, and to love and enjoy your work. Over to the right is a fountain which was, uh, I think, created by one student or two students. He then converted that small marquette, a small version of, the, of that sculpture uh, and fountain over there, and spent ages with kids after school turning it into fibreglass and, uh, and presenting it as you have it here today. Dan has used the palette knife, used lots of colour work and mixed up all his colours to make this wonderful piece of work uh, here.
Dan, we made it. Oh yeah, you're here. How are you? <laughs> I'm very well, thanks. And you? Good. How's Rena? Oh, she's very well, thanks. She's upstairs uh, busy preparing lunch for us. Fantastic. <laughs> Dan, what's your inspiration here? <sighs> well, like every time I start a painting, I don't have a, a clear idea what I want to do. Perhaps sometimes I want to express a feeling, state of mind, and so on. So the line I'm drawing has to be relevant to that. In this particular case, I thought, well, I drew a couple of lines. Then I thought, okay, I have a person, a woman, uh, waiting. It could be, she might be looking out of the window. I don't know yet. See, it's good. when the painting takes over, <laughs> uh, she might be looking out of the window. The sea, there, somebody's overseas or a, a fisherman, and she's waiting, uh, hoping to to see the person. Um, but I don't know yet. I might. I might uh, change the idea completely and instead of the window, I might just have shapes in the background. Because when I draw, uh, I make a composition, the background has to work with the figure. See, every little corner of, uh, of the painting is in very important, very important. So I might just change and, and do something like this, for instance. Um, like this, I don't know yet, it depends. Uh, another line going there. So when I finish, the lines are flowing. What I'm after is uh, order and harmony. <clears throat> after this, I have to start with the colors. Uh, sometimes I sit down, have another cup of coffee, say, now what color do you use first? <laughs> when I, I make up my mind, I use one color, and then I don't uh, have to work hard anymore because that color calls for another one, related. The two call for a third one, related, and so on. So that's where the old and harmony comes, lines and colors. So when do you finish this sketch, when do you know that you've got it wrong? Uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's another phase. <laughs> um, when I, I don't see anything disturbing me, everything is it, flowing, I've got uh, restful, serene, that's what I'm after, serenity. Um, then I stop. Well, I've noticed that a lot of your paintings, uh, you use the, the female form. Is there any reason for that? I like painting women, because it allows me to uh, use my movement and curves in order to bring that sort of serenity to the painting. Uh, because I can stylize the female figure. I can stylize it, uh, f uh, use my freedom in, in uh, flowing lines, taking license. Sometimes, sometimes um, anatomically, some people might think the figures are wrong, but because they think only about the uh, external reality, but we have to think about the reality of the painting. Now, a, f a male figure is more architectural. I can have my nice flowing lines, curves, so. Um, this one, when uh, I did a series of these, when I, I thought about the beautiful buildings we have in Perth, and they all disappeared. We don't have much left in the city. So I painted this one, where we, f we see the, the old, but nothing to do with Perth, of course, it's my, my uh, license I'm taking, uh, the old, and the new, so I call it the city rises. So the beautiful warmth you have in the architectural design here in the foreground, and the coldness of the glass houses, as you call them. Buildings doesn't happen very often in my work, but now and again uh, I come up with an idea. This one is alter ego. If you notice, uh, the, the, the hair belongs to one person, that's one. But the f there are two different faces. There are two different sort of feeling of personalities. Uh, but the, pe the two personalities, of course, they are uh, joined here with the, with the hands like that. So it's one person with two different personalities. Mother and child. Um, I was inspired by the idea of having, having the figure as I, as I uh, drew it. Um, Read, read them from the head to the arm, from this arm 
going around the figure of the child. We are one. The two are, are one. You can see the tenderness of the man uh, embracing from behind, and the, and the woman with her hands on the on top of the uh, man's arm. This there is tenderness there. With this, one, I'm referring to um, an episode in Greek mythology. Normally, I would use a white swan, but being uh, not a true blue, but uh, a very well rooted West Australian. <laughs> I use a black swan. I call this one the studio. Uh, it's mainly a still life, but I call it the studio because with all the props, uh, the candle, the jar, the jug, and, and, and salt brushes, but uh, it uh, gave me the opportunity to use all different shapes and different colors, whatever I call it. Doesn't matter, but I call it the studio because all the, the different things. Dan, I don't want to interrupt you, but did you know that Fred is in your cellar? Is he? I have, didn't know. <laughs> have you got a lock on the door? No, no. We better get there before he does some damage. If I had known it was coming, I would have put a lock. <laughs> we better get let's, there Let's quick. go then. Yep. Well, I hope he has left some for us. How much have you got down there? Well, only about 400 litres. Oh, no, you have practically none of that left. <laughs> 400 litres, or the width, about 400. I don't know now, after oh. Fred has been in there. You're going to have none left. Listen, I'm not going to go in there. I'm going to leave it to her. <laughs> hey, Fred. Yeah? I tell you what. They don't last very long, do they? Did you just empty that? How long have you been making wine for then, Dan? Uh, since... 1966, I get um, a ton, no Shiraz, because I like Shiraz, a ton of Shiraz grapes, we bring them here, I get some friends, that's important because I couldn't do it by myself. <laughs> when you've got a lot of wine, what do you do with it? Then I empty one of the tanks and I put the wine in uh, flagons, which is easy. So each time we need one in the house, it's one flagon into bottles. Come on, Fred. Oh, I like it, Dan. It's dark and mysterious down here, Dan. I don't trust you, man. I started painting when I was probably nine or ten, using bits and pieces I could find in a house, you know, house, house paint. And I just went on with that, and no, no training. I had my first commission when I was 12, because a lady next door, very religious, she asked me to paint a piece like this size from a small figurine. I learned my first money in art, <laughs> two liters. <laughs> you can see big groups, small groups, and individuals. I call that forum. That's where people meet. No realism, it's just a free design, just a suggestion of figures. And I enjoyed doing that. It was a big job. And inside we saw the four maritime republics of Italy in the 16th, 17th century. It's uh, Venice, powerful, powerful uh, city with a powerful fleet, very rich. Then we have Genoa, the other one, another republic. And then we have Pisa, another maritime republic. They had a fleet. And Amalfi, there's no seaport as we know of, and yet it was uh, uh, quite an important uh, maritime republic. So we got the four day in Italian club. I love mosaic, but it's far too involved. When I work quickly and it's easy going, I might even be able to do a four inch square in one day. How much was that? Four square inch. Is that all in a day? Mm. It's time consuming. Before you get any, you see any effect, it might take two days. <laughs> I had a lot of inquiries over the years, but when I mentioned the price, uh, I met Marlon <laughs> the first time 27 years ago. Tell me about Dan's work. Dan's work brings with it an attitude that probably reflects on his background and being Italian born but having lived in Australia for a long time. 
and then having taught in a Catholic institution for a long period of time, his work carries through with it something about his Italian background, something about his background having been exposed and working in a Catholic institution for a long time, and probably his own self-belief and his Christian following. I think since he's retired uh, and he's had a chance to work full time, some of those elements still come through, like the maternal aspects, because most of the things he paints are women. Dan really likes ladies too, he's a very gracious man. So we see some of what he had before coming through, but the element of the image now changing to be a little bit more uh, contrasting to what he had before, but still reflecting um, his attitude as a sculptor too, because Dan, while a lot of people maybe aren't aware of it, is an accomplished sculptor. Uh, there's a very beautiful two-dimensional piece on the Italian club in Perth, but there are other large public pieces around that he's produced. So what is his appeal? Again, it's the uniqueness of how he presents the work. And I think there's, if you look around the gallery, for instance, right now, and you compare his work to anybody else, it stands out. It has a uniqueness. So has some of the other work that we have here too. But it's probably the colour field that he uses and the draftsmanship and the way he applies it to his work and the uniqueness of bringing across the spirit of the person in the painting. Dan, for instance, comes from a very trained base. He's taught for years and he himself has been taught well. So he comes with an attitude of professionalism because that's what he loves to do and he's going to be doing it every day. And we know we can continue to have works coming through from them that probably are changing too and, and diverse. When she was art teacher at Newman College, then we, for a number, quite a number of years, we were in the same committee. It used to be called Joint Syllabus Committee for the Arts. Now we are back to a good rapport. Trevor said they knew my work years before. Did they really? Mm, they always had my, my work years before. That's why I was uh, so eager, you know, to to uh, ask me to exhibit with them. They came to Perth, they had an exhibition at Burswood, another exhibition, so I went to see them. So we invited them to dinner. So they came to dinner, and we discussed, we, you know, we developed that sort of friendship. Trevor at one stage, he said, well then, it's time to have an ex a solo exhibition. So I had the f my first one in 98, and that's, that's how it developed. I encouraged them to be themselves. Then, of course, it's my critical eye, assess their work and give them advice. I would never influence them according to my own work. To me, as I was taught when I was young, the personality is sacred. You cannot or you should not, in a class, make a lot of clones of yourself. If you got any advice to an up-and-coming painter, what would you say? Just be honest. Study, don't forget, don't be a traditional or a traditionalist, but don't forget tradition, respect tradition, and be honest about your work. I was sitting near him, he was sort of leaning over, he leant on me a little bit and as the headmaster was speaking there was a knock on the door and the secretary came in and said, listen there's an important phone call for Dan Mazzotti, uh, could he please come now straight to the, uh, to the office to receive this telephone call. Anyway Dan's fast asleep and he's having a very mild snore going on in the background. I, uh, Brother Carrig saw him that he was fast asleep and I think Brother Carrig knew he was asleep and has been for many meetings. I gave him a little bit of a nudge to wake him up. He immediately got up as Dan does and completely fell over on the ground because he'd crossed his legs 
and poor old Danny, that leg had fallen to sleep and he went basically bottom over. Uh, he then, out of embarrassment, ran straight out of the staff room. Everyone wondered whether he'd broken his leg or something like that and hid in the room. I ran to the room and unlocked the door so he could exit with great grace.